crowdfunding is the most accessible way to finance your product idea. The potential is limitless. It's helped countless small business owners raise money and build a following. But launching a successful crowdfunding campaign isn't easy. You can't simply set up a page on Kickstarter and wait for the cash to roll in. I'm Dan, I'm the co-founder of Unbound Merino, an e-commerce apparel brand behind three successful crowdfunding campaigns that generated over a million dollars in revenue. I'll show you everything we did to get our business started using crowdfunding, which led us to seven figures in sales in our very first year as a Shopify store. If you watch this entire video, you'll have my blueprint for success. I'll show you how to plan, prep, and launch a crowdfunding campaign. I'll even give you tips on how to fulfill your orders so you can transition into a self-sustaining business once your campaign is over. So grab a notepad and let's dive right into it. I often joke that at their core, crowdfunding campaigns are really just millennial infomercials because the successful ones I've seen follow a very similar format. They're typically a campaign that pitches a solution to a problem. So you'll have a video placed at the top of the campaign, catchy campaign slogans, one-time only pricing, and a seemingly endless list of benefits to the customer written as clever sales copy. A good crowdfunding campaign, it's like an exercise in sales mastery in a way that would make Ron Popeil proud. But wait, there's more. A crowdfunding campaign, beyond being a really great framework for pitching and selling your product, it's kind of like building the business plan in itself. In order to create a successful crowdfunding campaign, you also need to figure out the whole business. Beyond just having the idea, you need to consider what your value proposition is. You need to firm up the manufacturing, create a brand with a brand identity, have your pricing strategy figured out, have great photography and video content, and you need to have great sales copy that communicates the benefits of your product very succinctly. The process of creating a good and full crowdfunding campaign forces you to figure it all out. And that's what's needed to start a business anyway. So for example, our crowdfunding campaign, this took us a year and a half to complete from start to finish. And aside from it leading to the successful campaign itself, it gave us everything we needed to launch our e-commerce store on Shopify. Let's go through all the steps that my team and I did in order to have that successful launch. How we found our manufacturer. If you wanna sell a product, you need to have a product to sell. And finding a manufacturer is no easy task. For us, it was probably the most nerve wracking part of the whole equation. We needed to develop a great product that we were proud of. And to do that, we needed to find a great supplier who was willing to work with us. And to work with a great supplier, we needed to prove that we had the potential to be a great buyer, even though to be honest, we weren't sure if we'd ever put in a single order. To find a good manufacturing supplier, we turned to Alibaba. If you have a strong network in the world of manufacturing, you may not need Alibaba, but we needed it. We had no connections to any manufacturers who worked with Merino wool or who made apparel at all. So we began digging. Our goal was to find a manufacturer who didn't require minimum order quantities that were too unrealistic to us. We found that order quantities between one to 3000 units per style was on the low end. So that's the ballpark we had to play in. We'd click open a new tab for every manufacturer who looked like they might be a fit. So browser window after browser window was open until we had way too many tabs in our internet browser to even count. We must have opened like a few hundred tabs of potentially good fitting manufacturers. And then one by one, we looked at their page, see if we liked their photos, liked their pricing, believe they were established enough, and we let our gut guide us a little bit. So after closing the tabs of those that clearly weren't a fit, we reduced the list to around 80 to 90 manufacturing pages. And now it was time to start reaching out. We created the following message, which we sent out to every single manufacturer that still had an open tab in our browser. Obviously this questionnaire, it's unique to our production needs and it would definitely need to be different depending on whatever it is that you're manufacturing. But this is the word for word of what we sent to one of our suppliers. Subject line, quantity need, three to 5,000 pieces. Now this was an exaggeration, but we wanted it to look like a worthy buyer. My name is Dan Dembski. I'm an entrepreneur from Toronto, Canada. I'm the founder partner in three businesses, one which was recently sold, Hitsu Socks, Biz Media, Dbrand. So I was using my entrepreneurial resume as a way to try and build some credibility for myself. You should just sell yourself in any way that you can. I'm looking to start a new business retailing Merino wool t-shirts and I came across your page. I have a few questions. One, do you have different styles, fits, colors for your shirts that aren't shown on your Alibaba page? Two, are they 100% merino wool? Three, 
Do you have any merino wool blends with any other materials? Four, what is the cost per unit at your lowest minimum order quantity? Five, what's the cheapest price you can offer and at what quantity will we need to get to to get to that price? Six, how long does it take from the moment an order is placed to fully complete production and to have it on a shipping container on its way to Canada. Seven, can I visit your factory if we decide to do business with your company? Where exactly is it located? Eight, what are the options for branding our shirts? Heat transfer logo, stitched label. Please provide pictures of all the readily available options. Nine, where is the wool sourced from? Can you let me know all the details about your wool supplier and the certifications of wool quality? And 10, can we order samples? If so, what would be the cost for 10 to 20 sample shirts? I believe that's everything for now. Please provide us with a quotation and let me know if you're available next month for us to visit and inspect the factory should we decide to do business together. We're flexible on dates, but do require a factory visit if possible. I look forward to hearing back from you. Thank you. So almost immediately, the responses started to come back, some within a couple of hours. So we waited a few days and then we started to read through them. And we put aside those that responded with the best English, since they are overseas and we wanted to make sure that the communication was there. Those who seemed the most honest, those who were the most eager, and of course, those who were welcoming to have us come visit them in their factory. To us, it's very important to do business face-to-face, -face, but more so to see the environments in which our products were made. Even though we weren't sure if we'd ever meet them, we just wanted to be sure that the door was open. So out of the 80-ish questionnaires sent, we felt good with about 10 of the suppliers that responded. We got on Skype with them, we explained what we were looking to make, and we started to ask questions about the cost to produce samples. A few of them refused to make samples without a deposit for the entire order, which left us with five that we continued to be impressed by, and they were willing to make samples to our exact specs for a small sample fee. Once we confirmed that they would make our prototypes, we asked them to send samples of our clothing, but not made to our specs, so we could quickly test the exact wool that they'd be able to provide us, and we could test the material and see if we could push it to its limits. So what we did is we set up this exhaustive testing period where we tried the clothing out and we ended up nixing a couple of the manufacturers just because we didn't like the material, which left us with just two manufacturers. They hit the bullseye on every mark. We began to work with both of the manufacturers we love to develop prototypes, which included a self-funded trip to visit them in China to go over the design and to meet in person. I believe meeting in person, it makes the world a difference. You probably should know your manufacturers to observe their facility, assure they run an ethical operation, and to know where to find them if anything goes wrong. Hey, you never know. This won't always be possible for everyone, but it's worth the effort and consideration. Now, I'm not gonna elaborate more on the design and prototyping process because it's only gonna be relevant to us and to clothing, and that will change drastically if you're making something out of metal, plastic, or something else. Prototyping and sending samples overseas back and forth in relationship building, this isn't a quick process. It takes time, patience, and commitment. And today, we're proud to say that we've been back to visit our manufacturers many times and we have a truly great, trusting, and meaningful relationship with them. You can't create a bond this strong in a month. We've earned each other's trust and respect, and we understand each other's goals. Put the time in, it's important, and it's rewarding. Fast forward past our prototyping stage to having our own product in our possession, only a few pieces of each SKU, we were ready to move ahead and try to bring this product to market. We knew we had something amazing on our hands, but that's only half the battle. We had to convince a bunch of strangers that what we had was something special. Kickstarter versus Indiegogo. Now this is a question we get asked very often. Why did we choose the launch on Indiegogo over Kickstarter if Kickstarter is so much bigger and more well-known? Truth be told, a friend of ours, he came to us and he was mentoring us early in the campaign and he said, go with Indiegogo because you can take advantage of really, really good account support. Whereas with Kickstarter, they don't make it easy to talk with an actual person. Our decision came down to thinking that having an account rep was a good idea because we needed help as we tried to navigate our way into our first crowdfunding campaign. They took my phone calls, they provided insights, and most importantly, what they did is they cut a deal with us that if we got a certain amount of backing, they committed to feature us in their marketing emails. Indiegogo gave us the attention and support we needed and a marketing boost we couldn't have ever known was coming our way. I imagine working with Kickstarter is also awesome, but if you decide to go the Indiegogo route, 
make sure to negotiate your email placements early. That can make the world of difference for you. And also be sure to establish a relationship with your account rep as early as possible. Maybe you'll want to set up weekly calls with them, maybe ask them for whatever resources they have to help you build your campaign. This is a serious, serious competitive advantage that they have, and it's worth taking advantage of. How to set your campaign goal. In our campaign, we said we needed to raise $30,000 to launch the business and get to manufacturing. The reality though, is that if we raise less than $75,000, it would be nearly impossible for us to launch. And if all we made was $75,000, we would likely just squeeze by and not be set up well to transition into being a real business after the campaign. But we made our campaign goal much smaller than what we really needed for a couple of reasons. The first was that Indiegogo committed to promote us in their newsletter if we hit 30% of our campaign goal in the first 48 hours. To make that goal more achievable, we just lowered the target. But the main reason we wanted to have a smaller target was more for the optics of it. For potential backers, it's always more attractive to buy from a campaign that's doing really, really well. So if a campaign hit 100% of its funding goal in the first couple hours, there's a certain appeal it achieves that it likely wouldn't have if it was only 40% funded. So if you raised $30,000 of a $30,000 goal, you appear quite different from a campaign that raised $30,000 of a $75,000 goal, even though they both raised the exact same amount. Getting to 100% quickly can generate buzz and excitement around your campaign, and it's just a small little tactic you may wanna consider. This is all about that early momentum. We were doing whatever we could to appear like our campaign was killing it right from the get-go. And to lock in our newsletter feature with Indiegogo, we needed to get $10,000 in sales as fast as possible. We had no idea if people browsing their site would care enough to back our campaign. We had to get our own traffic to the campaign. And it had to be people we could count on to support us. And who better to lean on than friends and family? The answer, nobody. Now getting your mom, siblings, and best friends to back your campaign is easy but that alone wouldn't get us to $10,000 in sales. We needed to be able to get friends and acquaintances to back us if we really wanted to get that momentum. But the challenge is that there's so much noise on social media that posting about your campaign or even individually messaging your friends may just get drowned out by everything else that's going on in their news feeds and in their inboxes. What we did is we created around two to 300 videos where we individually asked our friends, each friend getting their own video, to go check out our campaign and ask them to support us. The thing here was that a Facebook or Twitter post can easily be ignored or missed, and that a mass message that is copied and pasted and sent to a bunch of friends can also easily be read and ignored. But there's something different about receiving a video that's custom made for you named yourname.mp4 or something. And I don't mean like a complicated edited video. I mean, turn your webcam on, hit record, one take, done. Upload to YouTube as an unlisted video, and send to the person you made the video for, telling them about your campaign and asking for support. My partners and I, we ended up staying up all night, having a few beers and pumping these videos out until we did one for every single friend and acquaintance that we were comfortable reaching out to. Now, these video messages, they're hard to avoid and people enjoyed seeing a video made just for them, especially if we included some inside jokes and some silliness. And at the end of the day, our batting average with this initiative was huge. And most of the people who watched them were happy to back our campaign. One last detail about the friends and family blitz. Don't have a thank you perk like many campaigns do for a dollar or five dollars that gives people the opportunity to help support you without actually receiving your product. It's a really nice thing for people to do, but if you give people the opportunity to kick a few charitable dollars to your campaign, many of them may do that instead of buying one of your actual perks. And that really won't help you. So just don't offer that sell your actual product. Our cheapest perk was $50. If people didn't want the product or they didn't want to spend $50 or more, no problem at all. We decided that we'd rather ask and have some people not contribute at all to the campaign than have an easy $5 thank you option that would potentially take away from lots of the 50, 100 or $200 backers. The benefit to them is that we had all sorts of super early bird prices in our first few days and most of them they just wanted to help out. And we made sure to express gratitude to each and every single one of our friends and family members individually for their generous support. Like we just wouldn't have gotten off the ground without them. Now for the record, we raised over $20,000 in the first 48 hours of our first campaign. This was 95% friends, family, and acquaintances. After the first few days, the order started trickling in from all over the world. 
because we were now a fast growing trending campaign on the platform. But it all started with our own self made momentum. Pre launch email acquisition. It's a crowdfunding best practice to build an email list prior to your launch. And to many successful crowdfunders, this is the cornerstone of their success. Now, truth be told, when we launched our first campaign, we didn't do this at all. We had zero emails to start, but in our later campaigns, having emails made the world of difference and jump started the first few days of our campaign. Having a large email list prior to your launch is massively beneficial. However, it comes with a cost. The most common way to acquire emails is running Facebook ads to some kind of lead generation landing page. Again, this costs money. When we dialed in our marketing efforts, we got the cost per email down to roughly $1.50. We used a landing page platform called Unbounce to direct our email acquisition ad traffic. The great thing about running these acquisition campaigns is not only do you get a builder email list, which ultimately should lead to future campaign backers, but also this is an opportunity for you to test various different brand messaging and ad copy and see what's gonna actually work for your campaign. Go and visit the Facebook ads library and you can look at advertising from many different competitors in your space and get a feel for what messaging may be working out there. Of course, there's no way to know for sure if these ads perform for them, but it's a good reference point anyway. So while email lead generation is incredibly beneficial, be mindful of the likely cost per email and conversion rate on those emails. Do some rough math and assume $1.50 to $2.50 per email with a 2 to 5% conversion rate on those emails. With that math, you could expect to pay $1,500 to $2,500 to get 1,000 email addresses, which roughly should convert to about 20 to 50 sales on your campaign, depending on your conversion rate. What do you expect the average order value price to be? If you start to break down the math, you may feel comfortable putting a few thousand dollars into your campaign pre-launch, maybe even more. But regardless of how much money you're comfortable investing pre-campaign, it's worth the effort, even on a small scale, to start testing your advertising and campaign messaging. At first, we were reluctant to approach a crowdfunding advertising partner. But when all was said and done, I think it's a really worthwhile investment. We initially didn't have any budget for ads. But once we got a taste for it, saw that it worked pretty well, we decided to pump more money into the campaign since we saw such a clear and direct ROI. Now, for those of you who don't have $10,000 to put into advertising, we didn't really either. We ended up putting a few thousand dollars of our own money in at the start. And then we later agreed to pay the additional $7,000 to our advertising partner. And they were gracious enough to put a bit of trust in us as they saw the campaign was clearly making money from the get go. Although we didn't have a budget at the start, it was an easy decision to put that extra money into ads mid campaign because we had a weekly report on the ROI. The way our advertising partner worked is they took a setup fee, then worked entirely on commission. They create the ads with our photos and assets, and they spend our budget for us to try to get the most return for their spend. Since they're working entirely on commission, they obviously want to see us succeed. The best part about working with an ad partner is not just the help on creating and deploying the ads, something we had no clue how to do effectively at the time, but more importantly, it's the access to their lists of people that they target with the ads. Their lists are ripe with people who truly love to back crowdfunding campaigns. Here's a look at what a weekly report looked like from our ad company. As you can see, most of the backers came from their master custom list, which is their exclusive list of people they've built over years doing ads in the crowdfunding space. Another thing you'll notice is the weekly metrics at the bottom of the spreadsheet. We specifically asked for these numbers so we could paint a picture of our true ROI. Total revenue for the week. Total costs. This wasn't just the cost of the ads. We had to pay the ad company a 10% commission for the sales they directly drove to our campaign. So we asked them to give us a true cost of our ad spend, including their share. Margin. Average customer value. Average customer value after fees. That same average, but factoring in the fees that will come from Indiegogo, as well as bank and PayPal fees. True take-home value. All things considered, this is what a transaction would net out to once everyone is paid. This is the number I had to really dwell on because the next number that mattered in the equation was the cost of the goods sold. Something that I'd have to consider importing fees on, duties, shipping, insurance, etc. All things considered, the money we were left with on the sales driven by ads, they weren't that profitable. But Week by week, we got to decide if it was worth continuing. And week after week, we decided that it was worth it because we still made a bit of profit at the end of the day. 
but also we acquired a new customer who we thought maybe would be a customer for years, which I could tell you now was a great strategy because many of these customers did stay with us for years. The other sweet part of the deal was knowing that they were driving much more traffic to our campaign page than we would ever be able to do alone. This helped us sustain our campaign in the trending category, which resulted in a lot of other backers that they didn't take commission on because we can't know for sure if they directly caused those sales. Now, they're fully aware of this and they're happy either way. Although impossible to measure, if you factor in the trending category and the lifetime value of these backers, this kind of is a no brainer decision. I highly recommend saving money to invest in advertising because at the end of the day, it really worked for us and it can really work for you too. Now, if you're looking to start a crowdfunding campaign, you probably have your sights set on creating your own Shopify store. And as you know, this is where we run our store too. And there's no better way to try the platform out than to sign up for their 14 day free trial. You don't need a credit card to sign up, but you'll get to test everything about the platform and see how it can work for you. We use Shopify, use it from the beginning, and it's the best way to start, grow, and scale your business. So sign up for the 14 day free trial and see what Shopify is all about. Early bird prices are another good way to keep the momentum going at the early stage. In our case, we use them to get a little bit closer to our fundraising goal. Now, our super early bird pricing was so cheap that the profit we made on these sales was negligible. But the fact of the matter is, is we had minimum order quantities to hit to go into production and having a one-time limited deal helped us get those impulse buys that got the money in faster so we can get closer to our manufacturing stage. Once we were past the minimum order quantity, we moved the campaign to our regular price. Use the early bird stage to get the money in, but then switch your focus to profit. The harsh reality of fulfillment. This is meant to be a cautionary tale. And I wish someone told us this before we launched the campaign, but I'm gonna tell you, if you're launching a campaign, obviously you're gonna assume or hope it's gonna be a huge success. And if it's a huge success, you're gonna have a lot of orders to fill. In our case, we had over 2000 orders to send to over 90 countries. We had our sleeves rolled way up and we were ready to burn the midnight oil to make it happen. Now, we knew this was gonna be a monstrous workload, but really we had no idea. Have you ever browsed through all the Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns that made many times their funding goal and looked at the comments from backers? It's actually pretty amazing how many campaigns were complete home runs, but then they have this long stretch of time where they're having to deal with angry backers who've been waiting for their products and whose patience are running thin. We strategized on how to fulfill orders and had a bunch of solutions that we ended up having to scrap last minute for various reasons. And when our inventory finally came in, we had a small storage warehouse full of boxes, a packing table, two Dymo printers connected to a stamps.com account, one hired helper, and a massive list of orders to start sending out. The big mistake we made is we had no idea how long it takes to package and ship a single order. And the main reason for that is because we didn't have the ability to practice until we actually had our product to pick, pack, label, and ship. Now, our packaging is pretty nice and meticulous and maybe a bit more elaborate than the average product shipment and it takes a bit of time to put together, but nothing could prepare us for the reality of it taking 12 to 15 minutes to fully pack and ship a single order. We're faster now, but at first we just weren't quick. Not to mention issues with stamps.com, Wi-Fi issues in the storage locker, not having phone numbers for certain international orders which are required. And as people were starting to expect their orders, we just couldn't get them out fast enough. Now, there is no good way to deal with angry, impatient backers. They spent good money on your product and they've already waited a long time. They have a lot of right to be upset, but there comes a point when you have to balance fulfilling orders and responding to backer queries. And it could be painful and brutal. Here's what we vowed to do differently in our next campaign. For starters, we would set up completely different expectations for delivery. We anticipated getting our product in late August and said we'd ship through September and October. If we could do it again, we'd say we'd be shipping between January and February. Perhaps we'd lose some Christmas orders, but we weren't able to ship a lot of them in time anyway. Our shipping ran well past December. And if we said January and February would be the shipping time frame and asked for four to six weeks for international orders, and if we started shipping in October, we'd be surprising people, but in the good way. Under promise and over deliver is not a new concept, but it's rarely executed in crowdfunding campaigns. Also, I would practice shipping orders until we were pros way before we even had the product. 
throw a few hundred bucks into a stamps.com account, if that's what you're using, and play pretend fulfillment. This is what I wish we did. I wish we got mock packaging that's similar to what the packaging we would end up ordering actually was like in at least a quantity of 20 and put it on the shelves the same shelves that we'd be using to store the real packaging. I wish we got mock products, in our case, a pile of t-shirts, socks, and underwear from our dresser. Got our packing table set up, got the stickers, got the labels, the printers, all of the software set up, poly mailers, anything that would be exactly like a real shipping process. I would then set a timer and package 20 orders, fully wrapped, boxed, labeled, and ready to send out to the post office. I would then take all the packaging, drive it to the post office when I got there, turn around and drive back, or do whatever we needed to do to exactly replicate the real shipping process. Once it's all done, you can cancel and refund all the stamps.com labels and get your money back, but you really need to get a handle on what's actually involved. You'll also learn the actual costs of shipping of your product both domestically and internationally. Fulfillment is hard, and it was a rude awakening for us, and apparently most other campaigns too. Understand this and get ahead to the best of your ability. What if your manufacturer doesn't deliver? I live in fear of this and it happens. I've heard many horror stories of people getting screwed over in the manufacturing process and it happens all the time. So you probably should live in fear of this too. But we found a few manufacturers we really liked and we did our initial order with one of them. You know, we knew the prototypes we made were incredibly high quality and we saved unworn samples for comparison purposes, but we left nothing to chance. When the production started, we boarded a plane to Shanghai, got a hotel room for two weeks, and moved our lives there to oversee production. This cost us quite a bit of money, obviously, but we had it in the budget from our campaign earnings. We told our manufacturer that we'd be coming to inspect production well in advance. And our thinking here was that they wouldn't screw up our order if they knew we were going to be there to watch it being made in real time. I can't know for sure if this made a big difference, but maybe it did and I suspect it might have. All I know is that the quality of our mass production was on par, if not better, than our prototypes. And this insurance to us was priceless. Not to mention going to Shanghai is a great time. The life experience of traveling to be with and eat with locals, it's one of the greatest bonuses we could have ever imagined. So consider budgeting a trip to visit your manufacturers right into your campaign. Make a budget for the entire business for six months after the campaign ends. Bucket money for marketing like SEO and ads, hiring help, taxes, duties, legal fees, influencers, contingency. Just start listing what six months of costs are for the business and allocate the money as it comes in. We did six months, that's just our approach, but it's a meaningful exercise that opens your eyes to how fast you can spend a large sum of money. By doing it in advance, you give yourself a really nice runway to focus on after your campaign ends. We waited to be funded before dishing out money and energy into this stuff, but I've been burned before and it's not worth messing around with. If your side project turns into a business because of crowdfunding, get all this boring stuff out of the way. In my previous sock company, Hitsu, we got a cease and desist after our first brand name one year into running the company after spending $10,000 on packaging too. It was awful and it nearly sunk the business. The company that sent us a cease and desist is a multi-billion dollar company and this was a fight we couldn't afford to pursue. Take care of the legal stuff as early as possible. Crowdfunding is a journey, but it's a great and worthy one if you want to take the leap and start your own business. I hope this was helpful as you start your journey into entrepreneurship. Work your hardest, put your all into it, and give it a go. The best part about crowdfunding is that the worst possible outcome is people don't back your campaign. In previous eras, people would lose their homes trying to dive into a business like this. For us, Indiegogo proves product market fit without us having to dish out large sums of money. Our ideas and our hard work were enough to give us our start. And if this helps you on your journey, I'd be thrilled. If you found this video to be helpful, make sure that you give it a thumbs up. That actually helps the channel and community grow. And for more simple, actionable tips on how to grow your online business, make sure you're subscribed to Learn with Shopify so you don't miss out on future releases. I'm Dan Dembski, and thanks so much for watching.